Why would psilocybin work for depression? Well, so a primary question is why are we even looking at psychedelics? So we're looking at psychedelics for two reasons. One is that, as I mentioned earlier, mental illness is burgeoning in society. Anxiety is the fastest growing diagnosis on both sides of the Atlantic. And more and more people are depressed. And some of the reasons are, are mentioned in Johann Harris' book, Lost Connections, where he talks about just the loss of human communion which is not the only, but certainly a major factor. So for, for social reasons, mental illness is, or mental discomfort is rising. Number one, number two, there's the largely complete failure of the Western medical system in which I was trained and practiced to deal with the crisis of mental health. We don't understand it. Uh, I can go into the many reasons we misunderstand mental illness, but fundamentally, we're in denial about the unity of, of, of the human soul and the mind and the body. And we're in denial about the social nature of human beings. We look upon mental illness as biological problems. So people are looking for solutions outside the mainstream, uh, as, they, as they have to because within the mainstream, the responses and the preventions are so inadequate. Now psychedelics, psilocybin, specifically but not exclusively get to a part of ourselves that usually we're not in access of. So they get to the, the unconscious part while we're conscious. So we get to experience our unconscious while conscious. And we can see what's in there. Now why on the physiological level uh, the psychedelics do that, I have to keep looking it up. I just, I'm not keeping in my head the particular neuroscience and brain physiology that's involved. But clearly parts of the brain are being activated that are usually uh, are shut down or we have no access to. And so psilocybin has been used in two ways. It's been used as single, fairly large dose experiences. And through those experiences, people get in touch with parts of themselves they usually have no access to. For example, they might have a deep spiritual experience, a deep experience of unity, a deep experience of the true self. Part of their real self that usually are shut down from their daily experience. Well, that could be tremendously healing. What if I no longer saw myself as an isolated little ant crawling around for survival in this huge ant heap, but as a meaningful and genuine part of a larger whole and that unity is unshakable no matter what happens to me and no matter what I feel at a particular moment. What if I could be conscious of that unity? It, it gives you a totally different experience of life. So along with this other psychedelic psychedelic uh, psilocybin can do that and what's striking is that it doesn't matter what the psychedelic experience when people describe their experience of unity it's all the same language. And it's all the same language if people get there without psychedelics. So either everybody's hallucinating and everybody's crazy, or they're having some genuine experience of something that's deeper than our usual consciousness can permit. And that's what happens, I believe, with the side of cyber. Then people also use it, and this is still experimental, on a microdose level, where people are not using it to have this deep experience. In fact, they might have a, an amount that doesn't even give them an altered consciousness in the short term, but over a couple of weeks, microdosing where they might use for two or three days and then not use for a few days, but in a small, barely perceptible dose, it alters their brain physiology in such a way that they're no longer addicted. In, in, in which case, they're using it like an antidepressant. So uh, these experiences, these plants traditionally, and, and the mushrooms have been used traditionally by native peoples. Ayahuasca has been used traditionally by native peoples. Iboga has been used traditionally by native peoples in Africa and Latin America and North America, peyote and so on. But there's always in a context, always under the guidance of very experienced elders who've been through their own experience. Now in our world, we tend to be kind of anarchistic and individualistic. Uh, sometimes people might use these substances who are not ready for it not been prepared for it 
and it might release emotions and visions in them that they don't know how to integrate and how to handle. So I've seen a few people lose it as a result of psychedelic experiences. I've not seen personally, I know of some, but I've not seen any tragic outcomes, but I've seen some difficult outcomes. So the risk is using it when you're not prepared and not under appropriate guidance. Now, some of these substances should also not be used with certain people with various mental health conditions. For example, if you have a history of mania, you better not use ayahuasca, I don't think, because it can trigger your mania, or LSD for that matter. These two kinds of work occurred with the psychedelics. The first work, which preceded the second, was very responsible scientific research work. And some very important work was done with LSD, uh, for example, in Canada and in North America and perhaps elsewhere, uh, where they found some very positive results in its impact on mental illness. That was scientific work, very rigorous. It may have had its flaws, but the intentions were purely to advance science and, and, and human health. That then got coupled in the 60s with the cultural explosion of psychedelics with the anti-Vietnam War movement, the whole alienation between generations that became very apparent in the 60s, the whole mistrust of tradition and, and elder guidance, uh, not to mention the massively experienced need to escape from the rigidity of the mainstream culture. A lot of young people got involved in using, using psychedelics, not traditionally, not under guidance, and certainly not under any kind of scientific inspiration. So a lot of people used it, and there was a lot of negative experiences. There were people who soared off the top of buildings under the impact of LSD, thinking they could fly, and of course, finding out that they couldn't really fly. Uh, some people went insane. Uh, using these psychedelics again because they weren't using them in the right context for the right indications with the right guidance. The mainstream uh, ideologues and politicians and scientific figures who were suspicious of psychedelics in the first place and who didn't like things happening that didn't occur under their control in the first place, then either in, they were inspired by these missteps or used them as an excuse to clamp down on the whole field of psychedelic research. So there's a retrenchment and a, a giving up of some very useful avenues of inquiry that persisted for decades until again, the cultural crisis and the general inadequacy of mainstream medical perspectives led to a resurgence, which is what we're seeing now. And for the most part, what we're seeing now is much more scientific and much more responsible use of these substances.